Hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 1. I'm still your host, Dr. B. Uh, we're going to talk about internal controls. Uh, the concept behind in internal controls is how we effectively manage our assets. How we effectively manage our assets. Internal controls represents the control of assets within the company. Assets being cash, accounts receivable, property, plant, and equipment, inventory, especially inventory. How we're effectively managing those things. That's what internal controls is. And it has to do with things like how do we safeguard those things? How do we uh, document the movement of those assets, etc. That's what internal controls are. Uh, and I'll tell you a couple stories along the way about internal controls. We'll also talk about cash and this thing called fraud. Ah, it's fraud. I know it gets me every time. Okay. So internal controls. It's a process and a procedure guided by policies that help us to protect our assets, ensure reliable accounting, uphold company policies, and promote efficient operations. When we protect our assets, what we're talking about there is how are we safeguarding them? How, how, how is my cash being protected? Well, I have a lock and I got a key. <laughs> uh, how is my how are my how is my inventory being managed and protected? Well, I have valuable inventory locked up in a storage area under a lock and key and a couple of cameras. And for the non-valuable inventory, I have that in a separate location, whatever. That's methods that we use to protect the assets, right? How is my cash being handled? That's a way of protecting the assets. Ensure reliable accounting. Accounting is usually done by more than one person. Yeah. Here's how. I usually have two individuals. One taking care of the assets. And the other person take care of the liabilities. Usually, I have someone who takes care of accounts receivable, and someone else takes care of accounts payable. The reason why is I don't want the same person who's taking the cash in to be the same person who's taking the cash out. Right? The reason why I do that is because it's important that the company has a separation of duties and responsibilities. That separation in, helps to ensure that my accounting is accurate and reliable. Another example is I'll have someone else counting the cash in the cash drawer and verifying that amount with the person who collected it. A couple of stories. In the hotel business, we used to have a what's called a cash room. Okay. The cash room, it's literally a safe. It's a walk-in safe. And in that walk-in safe, there would be cash counting machines, and there would be two individuals. One person counting the cash, another person recording the cash transactions on the ledger, and then of course we had the cash counting machines. One of those two people would also put the cash into the safety deposit boxes, and the other person would bring them to the bank. Again, separation of responsibilities. But it helps to ensure that the, our cash uh, counts were correct. 
on Eliath. Having more than one person in a cash room is very important. Uh, and of course, the, pol the our internal controls help us to uphold company policies and promote efficient operations. Within, within uh, the technology realm, we usually have a lot of cameras. We got uh, security guards, cameras, locks, safes, uh, cash drawers, etc. All these are parts of internal control. The reason why we have such internal controls and strict methods for ensuring that our financial reporting is accurate is stems from the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act was created because of fraudulent situations, we'll say. Some of you are old enough to remember the Enron scandal. Enron was a very large energy company in Texas. This energy company in Texas uh, got, got, they got really big. You know, it was a publicly traded company. And what they decided to do was to overstate their sales by creating fictitious sales records. They, what, and that process, what they did is they made themselves look really good. Okay. Oh, I got lots of sales. Got lots of customers. That's really good. Okay. They did that to attract new investors, to attract new shareholders. That's illegal. You can't be generating sales that didn't happen. Okay. But they did it. Right. And so uh, a couple people went to jail for life. A couple people uh, died. Yeah. Um, it was a very serious fraud that was perpetrated by this big company. And uh, for those of you who want to watch the documentary, just search for it. It's on Netflix. It's on everything. Just, just you can even just Google Enron scandal, and uh, you'll find it. But a lot of things happen in that process. But one good thing that came from that is called the Sarbanes Oxley Act that was passed by uh, Congressman Sarbanes and Oxley. I think they're senators. Anyway, uh, so they passed this act, and, it, and what it does is it forces publicly traded companies to ha have an established set of internal control processes that ultimately lead to transparent, honest financial reporting. The income statement, balance sheet statement, have equity, saving cash flows, etc. Uh, but that's what this act did, is it helped to create that set of standards for internal control processes, ultimately to help future investors from getting ripped off. Along with that came organizations, governing bodies, to create what's called the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, also known as COSA. And what this body did is they helped to establish five key components to internal controls, which ultimately adds quality to the accounting information being established. The first is to control the environment. This relates back to my story, right, about the cash room at the hotel with having two different individuals counting cash and collecting the cash and recording it, and et cetera. That's a part of the control environment. I also have my security cameras and security guards, et cetera. Well, that's part of the environment. That's the natural environment within the building. The second is that uh, COSO established is called risk assessment. 
it's important to assess the risk of the company. An example of risk assessment is making sure that your customers don't trip and fall. <laughs> okay, you don't want your customer falling down on your property. Let me tell you, your customer will sue you. <laughs> oh, I tripped and I fell on some ice on your sidewalk. What's going to happen? They're going to sue you. Okay, so risk assessment. Make sure that that sidewalk is salty. Control activities. That's having, having a set of internal control processes that separate the responsibilities of individuals. That's part of control activities. Providing clear, concise information and communication to your employees, stakeholders like customers, uh, the government, uh, whoever's interested, yeah. Clear, concise information communication. And of course, monitoring that process of internal controls, making sure that they're working. Internal control principles, okay. These are like a very basic set of principles for internal controls for companies to have. One, of course, is to establish responsibilities of the individuals within the company. Who's responsible for what and doing what? Going back to my earlier example in the cash room, one person is responsible for counting the cash, another person is responsible for recording the cash, another person is responsible for bringing the cash to the bank, etc. Establishing the responsibilities of individuals. Two, of course, is to maintain adequate records. Going back to my earlier example, the person recording the cash transactions on the cash ledger is a representation of maintaining adequate records. Three is to ensure assets and uh, we have our assets are insured meaning there's insurance, right, to cover any mishandling of our assets. And then we have bond key employees. I'm going to break this down for you, okay? Insured asset simply means I have insurance through an insurance company that says, hey, if something happens to my assets, they'll replace the value of the assets. That's having insurance on the assets. The second part is, this one called uh, bond key employees. Bonding. The word bond simply means is that we have a contract in place, okay, for an employee of the company. The agreement is between the individual and the company. And that agreement is called a bond. And what it does is it says, hey, employee, you're responsible for managing these assets. If you do something that is illegal or unethical, this is what will happen to you. Okay, that's bonding. Number four is separate record keeping from the custody of assets. Going back to my earlier example with the two individuals in the cash room, one employee was counting the cash, the other employee was recording the transactions. That is separate record keeping from the custody of assets. I've separated the, the duties and responsibilities between those two individuals. The other thing is we keep the record of those cash transactions separate from the actual cash itself. It's in a separate room, okay, under a lock and key. Five is divide the responsibility for related transactions. In our accounting office, we had one person responsible for paying bills. That's the accounts payable person. And we also had one res individual responsible for collecting from our customers. That's the accounts receivable position. 
We also had a third person responsible for payroll, just payroll. That's all she did was payroll. And then we also had the financial controller who ultimately managed all those individuals, but did not perform those responsibilities because, again, we have to keep those uh, responsibilities separate. Number six is to apply technological controls. This would be things like safes, lock and key. I know it's not very technological, but it is. Cameras, security cameras, security guards, safes, etc. This goes on. Those are technological controls. And number seven, perform regular and independent reviews. Once a year, at least, it's good practice to have your company audited on purpose. Okay. And the reason for that is because having somebody from the outside audit your company on a regular basis helps to ensure that your accounting records are accurate. So uh, establishing the responsibilities, individuals should be clear that the, uh, the um, responsibility should be clearly established. Certain tasks should be assigned to uh, should be assigned to one person. You know, se separate the responsibilities in between individuals. And within this clearly established set of responsibilities, we can determine who's at fault when something goes wrong. <laughs> Maintaining adequate records, again, extremely important. Protecting the assets, helping managers to, uh, to monitor the company activities. Records include things like um, general ledgers. The sales receipts, uh, pretty much any paperwork, really. We want to make sure that these are adequately maintained. Like, for example, in my accounting office, the way it works is I have the invoice attached to the copy of the check, but also attached to the invoice, I have the packing slip that came in the box. I have the original purchase order. And I staple those four documents together. Okay. Those four documents represents a completed transaction. So when I get audited by the IRS, They'll say, hey, what about this sale? And I'll be like, here it is. Here's all the supporting documents. Maintaining adequate records is so important, especially when there's an audit involved. Yeah. Having insurance, extremely important, especially for your assets. You know, that's why, like, um, for those of you who have home insurance, it's important that your home insurance represents the fair value of everything in your house. So if it burns down, the insurance company will provide you with a check for the fair value of everything that you lost. So that's why in insuring the asset, the house, very important. So you're insured against losses, you know, should something happen. The bonded employee is also technically insured with that agreement between the company and the employee. The company is also insured against theft by that employee. <laughs> so that's why having that bond, that agreement, very important.
making sure that there's a uh, separation of duties and responsibilities between employees for the recording of accounting assets, extremely important. It reduces the risk of theft when there's more than one person involved. Yeah. Uh, and if the two employees get together and they agree to commit a crime, uh, you know, that's or perpetrate a fraud. Oh, my lights just flickered. Kind of weird. I'm still online, right? You guys can still hear me. Yes. Okay. Thank you. If two employees get together and they try to commit a fraud, they call it collusion. And that's one of the only ways that they can try to circumvent this type of internal control. But oftentimes they get caught. Trust me, they'll get caught. So important to divide the responsibility between the related transactions. I have one employee that takes care of accounts receivable, another employee that takes care of accounts payable, and another employee that takes care of payroll. It ensures that each person is acting responsibly it helps prevent fraud and also errors. Call that separation of duties. We use things like time clocks, lock and key, safes, uh, guards, scanners, you name it. Electronic filing systems. All of these technological controls help us to prevent fraud and also provides uh, accurate accounting information. It's also recommended that the company implement once a year an external auditor to come into the company and verify that the accounting information is accurate. Uh, so we call we, so the person that comes in from the outside is called an auditor. And they'll come in and they'll verify that all of your accounting information is accurate. It's true. It's transparent. Uh, it helps prevent errors. It also helps prevent fraud. So yeah, some of the benefits, reduce processing errors, more extensive uh, records are being kept. There's an evidence of the process in place, helps to improve e-commerce, and there's a separation of duties. All of those things help help the company too. Uh, but I mean, that's the benefit, that's the cost benefit. Unfortunately, sometimes humans still screw things up, so they might be careless, misjudged, or they're confused. We call those human errors. Humans, unfortunately, can also perpetrate fraud. They'll do this intentionally. Uh, they defeat the control processes for personal gain. Um, yeah, that's why people. But people commit fraud fraud for reasons, right? There's an opportunity to commit the fraud. There's some type of financial pressure that's telling them to commit the fraud, and then they'll rationalize why they're doing it. That's the, what we call the fraud triple threat. And the, of course, the cost benefit tells us the cost related to internal controls that, that they will, won't exceed the benefit of having those controls in place cost benefit. So that's uh, internal controls and fraud. Any questions on those before we get jump into cash? Everyone loves cash. Yeah, all good so far.
Okay, let's talk about cash. As I mentioned earlier, it's really important that you have more than one person controlling cash. Handling cash from separate from the record keeping of cash, cash receipts are uh, deposited into a, the bank, and cash disbursements are made by check. I brought up the concept of the petty cash fund, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in detail. So at the hotel, at the front desk, we would have employees, uh, they, they'd be act, they would have access to petty cash. Usually a couple hundred bucks, we would keep at the front desk for small things that needed to be taken care of. Oh, I'll run down to the bank, to the post office to get some stamps. Oh, the, this guest needs some dry cleaning taken care of. Oh, the, um, a guest showed up in a cab, you know, whatever. Petty cash, right? So. But for every dollar that was taken out of that petty cash bank, there needed a receipt. Okay. So an employee would take $10, go down to the post office, get some stamps. They would need to bring a receipt for that $10 and put it into the petty cash bank. So that way I can properly account for the use of that cash in order to replenish the petty cash fund uh, but that's part of the control you know, is by having those receipts as you know cash is cash coins paper money checks money orders those are, those are all cash. That's cash. Cash equivalents are of like um, stocks and bonds, short term investments. Those are what we call cash equivalents. But cash is, is cash. Currency, coins, checks. That's cash. Money orders, certified checks. Managing the cash is really important. Okay. The reason why managing cash is important is because the business will go out of business if they don't have enough cash to operate. If you don't have cash to pay your bills or your employees, you're done. Okay, there's no, you're not in business anymore. If you can't pay your bills, you can't pay your employees, you're done. You don't have a business. So managing the cash is really important for that reason. Okay, so you don't go out of business. Number one, most important. But number two, you need to make sure you have enough cash to pay your employees their wages. That's a law. You have to have that. To operate. So typically we have a minimum amount set in a separate bank account just for employee wages. A minimum amount in a separate bank account just for employee wages. It helps to ensure that I have enough cash on hand to pay my employees. Okay, otherwise they'll sue me and I'll go out of business. Yeah, managing the cash, really important. You have to have enough cash to do a couple things. Enough cash to grow the business. Enough cash to pay the expenses for the business. Enough cash to pay the liabilities for the business. We do that, and the way to make sure that we have enough cash is we manage the cash coming in from our customers, accounts receivable, that we're collecting those receivables. We uh, do our best to effectively manage our pay, our liability payments. And we set aside cash for 
capital expenditures, like the purchase of property plant equipment or repairing property plant equipment. And we have enough cash set aside for other investments. So, yeah, it's really important that we manage our cash effectively. So, um, we know that we have cash coming in from our customers. Some of that cash comes in from the receipt of cash from our accounts receivable. That's one way. Another way is the customer paid in cash up front. But either way, we need to manage that cash. So here's a uh, nice illustration that shows us the separation of the responsibilities for managing the cash. But it also shows us how that cash is entered into the accounting information system through the process. So first and foremost, every time that we receive cash, we need to state the reason why we received the cash. Was it cash from our customer to satisfy an account receivable? Was it from the sale of goods and services uh, over the counter or whatever? We need to state the reason. So we create the journal entry. Right? We debit cash to increase the cash, and we credit sales, or we credit accounts receivable, or whatever it is. Yep. We do that through the register. So this kind of shows us a nice visual representation of how that works. And then that information flows into our accounting information system. Now, sometimes we make errors, okay? It happens. It happens a lot, especially in retail. Let's say you're, let's say you're a cashier um, at a grocery store, okay? Let's say, let's say you're a cashier at Safeway. You're a cashier at Safeway. And uh, sometimes your drawer might not be correct. That happens from time to time. Sure. Sometimes you forget to give the customer their change. Whoops. <laughs> I kept their change by accident. That happens. Sometimes you gave the customer too much change. Whoops. <laughs> it happens. People are not perfect. We make mistakes. There might be a difference between the actual cash that's in the register versus the cash receipt on the tape from the cash register. This difference is often called cash over and short. So in accounting, we need to account for that mistake, that difference. So here's an example. I got a cash register that shows $550, but the amount of cash in the register shows $555. Somebody obviously didn't get their change. <laughs> so we need to record that extra $5. So the way it works is we debit the total amount of cash, $555. We credit our sales, $550. And then we credit this account called cash over and short because we're over by $5. We have to account for the $5 somehow. So we do it in cash over or short. So we credit cash over or short when it's over. If it's under, we debit that account.
Here's an example of when we're under. And sometimes we make that mistake too. I gave the customer too much change back. So here's an example. We made total sales, $625, shown on our cash registers machine. The amount of cash in the register is 621 Somebody gave too much change back to the customer. So we debit cash, $621, because that's the amount of cash in the register. Then we debit this account called cash over and short. We're short by $4, so we debit by $4. So we credit our sales, $625. Cash over or short. It happens, you know. No one's perfect. Sometimes someone might send us cash in the mail. Don't ever do that. Okay, please don't send physical cash in the mail ever. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. The mailman might decide to give himself a payday that day. Okay, don't send cash in the mail. Send a check. Okay, don't send cash. <laughs> but sometimes it happens. Sometimes people send cash or a check in the mail. So we receive. The cash in the mail. There are two people assigned to opening the mail. At the hotel, the assistant to the general manager, she was responsible for getting the mail. She would bring that to the mail room. And then someone in the mail room would separate where the mail's going. Yeah. Accounts receivable, uh, the accounting office, wherever. Okay. Sales department, wherever. They open the envelope, take the check out, match the check to the account receivable. That check then goes to the controller, the controller brings that check to the bank. Cashier deposits the check into the bank. The record keeper records the amounts received in the accounting records. Match it to the customer who it's from and the amount that we received. That's the process for you know, when we receive cash payment or check payment in the mail. Of course, we need to control all of our cash payments, you know, because cash is the biggest thing that, that gets stolen. We require all payments to be made by check. Please don't send cash in the mail. It's very dangerous. Don't do that. Send a check. Limit the access to checks except for those who have the authority to sign them. The way it worked at my hotel is the person who worked in accounts payable, they would print the check, you know, the amount, who's going to, etc. And then I had two people signing the check, the controller and the general manager. Those were the only two people who were authorized to sign checks in the hotel. And of course, it's a, it was also important to have our cash budget. This helped us to manage our cash coming into and out of the business. It would include a projection of cash receipts and disbursements. Another thing we had is called a voucher system. This has to do with your discussion board that's due Sunday night. Yeah, this part's the, important to listen to. Voucher system has to do with your discussion board due Sunday night. The voucher system helps to establish procedures for verifying, approving, and recording liabilities for eventual cash payments. Here's a simple way of thinking about this. You received your electric bill in the mail, okay, for last month. 
you're going to pay it. When you pay it, at the bottom of the bill, there's this thing that you tear off. Okay? It has the account number on it. It has the dollar amount on it. It has where it's going. Yep. That's a voucher. That little receipt thingy at the bottom of the bill that you got, you tear it off and you put it in the envelope with your check. That's called a voucher. It helps to track the payment. Make sure that it goes to the right account. That's why the account number is on there. Make sure it goes to the right place. That's why the address is on there. Make sure it's for the right amount. That's why the amount's on there. That's a voucher. That's what that is. When that voucher is received on the other end, it matches who's paying it for that account. It's verified, approved, and recorded. This goes back to what I had discussed earlier. Voucher systems are really important because it helps to track the uh, order of the primary documents. Earlier I had mentioned that I always attach the purchase order to the invoice, to the packing slip, to a copy of the check. That's my process at the hotel. The reason why I did that is because it established a set of internal controls. And if I ever get audited, I can show the auditor, hey, this is the process. Here are all my supporting documents for that sale or for that invoice, whatever. But the same process applies. That's called a voucher control system. The requisition, the purchase order, the invoice, the receiving report, invoice approval, and ultimately the check. All these documents together represents the voucher. Yeah. It's a good system. Now it's the uh, let's see. Uh, Destiny, uh, the voucher system attached. Uh, okay. So, so Destiny, here's how I want you to think about this. Within the voucher system, we are controlling all of our primary documents. Okay. It starts out with a requisition form and then ultimately a purchase order and then when i uh, issue the purchase order my vendor will provide me with whatever i ordered right they'll also provide me with an invoice which is a bill so i give my vendor the purchase order my vendor gives me the inventory that i ordered along with an invoice and a packing slip, also known as a receiving report. And then it goes to the invoice approval and then uh, accounts payable will cut the check and I'll attach a copy of the check to all of those documents. So all of these documents get attached together. Okay. Purchase requisition, purchase order, invoice, receiving report, invoice approval, and a copy of the check all together. That's called a voucher system. Okay. And the reason why it's important to have that voucher system is to create a paper trail. So that way, when you get audited, you can say, hey, I did make that purchase. Here's all the supporting documentation. It's in my voucher system. And remember that voucher, uh, it's kind of like a tracking number yeah, that's on all these documents. Does that make sense?
Yes. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Now let's talk about petty cash a little bit more. I mentioned the concept of petty cash from my experience at the hotel. So a little bit of cash, usually a couple hundred bucks in cash up front at the hotel. And it's used to pay for small things like uh, the, the purchasing stamps, office supplies, taking care of minor repairs. Uh, we used to use it to pay the person who would bring fresh flowers from the lobby, um, et cetera. Yeah. But usually very small transactions. So what we did at the very beginning is we had to establish a petty cash fund, a new petty cash fund. And the way it worked is we took cash out of our bank account. And we put it into an envelope and put it into a safety deposit box behind the front desk. Of course, there's an accounting transaction that needs to happen, right? Because we're taking cash out of the bank and putting it in the front desk. So what we did is we debit a new account called Petty Cash. Let's say by $250. Then we'll credit cash $250. What I did is I took the physical cash out of my cash account and put it into a new cash account called Petty Cash. So debit Petty Cash to increase the Petty Cash. And I credit cash to reduce my original bank account, my cash account. That's to establish the fund. So debit, petty cash, credit cash to establish the petty cash fund. That's the transaction you early on, you know, when you know that you're going to have a petty cash uh, account. Now, throughout the month we'll say the front desk will use that uh, petty cash for again small cash payments so here's a list of example transactions that have happened to that petty cash fund tile cleaning service $46.50 uh, transportation of merchandise 1505 ship uh, customer uh, package Delivery five dollars, office supplies four dollars seventy five cents. So they, they throughout the month they used the petty cash fund up to seventy one dollars and thirty cents. Remember we established it at seventy five. So what happens is, I'll make a general uh, journal entry. I'll, rec I'll debit all of those various expenses based off of the use. Right, so I'll, I'll debit cleaning expense, I'll debit office supplies, I'll debit uh, delivery expense, I'll debit shipping expense equal to $71 and change from $71.30. And then uh, I'll, I'll uh, credit at a cash fund. Now, debit all the expenses, credit petty cash fund. That represents the, the balance of petty cash. Once I've done that, I can then reimburse the petty cash fund. So I debit all the expenses, credit the cash to reimburse the petty cash fund. To increase my petty cash fund, I debit petty cash, credit cash. To decrease it, I debit cash and credit petty cash. Sometimes, this used to happen every so often, I used to get pretty upset. And even if it's small amounts, it would drive me nuts. Sometimes <laughs> the petty cash fund will be missing a receipt. Ah, oh, man, that drove me nuts. Every time. I'm like, 
What happened to the receipt? You know, it's like, oh, I lost it. Oh, I forgot to ask for one. Okay, so it happens, right? So we used an account called Cash Over and Short to account for the difference, right? And then we would use an account called Miscellaneous Expense to record those expenses. But yeah, the, the, we would use uh, cash over and short to account for the differences in petty cash that we're missing a receipt for. Yeah, it happens. It used to drive me nuts. But it, it works the same way as, uh, you know, that cash over and short that I showed you from the cash register example earlier on. So if there's a shortage in cash, uh, we debit cash over and short. If there's overage, we credit it. I don't know why there'd be an overage in petty cash, but it, it does have time time. Now, with cash, as you are probably more than aware, there's a lot of fees. <laughs> Bank fees. Oh, I hate banks so much. Banks charge us things. It, we get charged the bank fee just for having an account with them. Isn't that ridiculous? So bank account fees. Uh, banks provide a lot of different services. Signature cards, deposit tickets, bank statements, ET, EFTs, checks. And of course, the account themselves. These are all things that the bank provides. They also charge us for things called bank fees. A deposit ticket. We use the deposit tickets when we deposit our cash okay? and checks. The deposit ticket goes into the bag with the cash and the checks, goes down to the bank. We get a receipt of that, and it shows us how much cash went into the bank. It also shows us checks that went into the bank as well. It serves as proof of the deposit. And of course, uh, we use checks to take money out of the bank for whatever reason. We all know how checks works, hopefully. Uh, hopefully you've all written a check at one day in your life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, who's make, who we're paying, the maker, that's us, we're paying it to somebody, the dollar amount, what it's for, the memo line, signature. Bank statements. Uh, at the end of every month, I get a bank statement. It tells me it's a summary of all the money that went in and all the money that went out. Uh, checks, their numbers, the amounts, in and out. And cash, in and out. These days, there's a lot, there's a lot more information on those. So, uh, in order for me to make sure that the cash balance I have in my QuickBooks, my accounting information system, matches what I actually have in the bank, I have to go through a process called a bank reconciliation. Bank reconciliation is prepared uh, to identify any differences between the cash being reported in the bank and the cash on my balance sheet. And of course, I make adjusting entries to make sure that I get both of those to be equal. The amount of cash in my balance sheet needs to equal the amount of cash in my bank account. And I do that through bank reconciliation. You know, add any deposits and transits, take out any outstanding checks, 
add or subtract corrections from bank errors. That's what I do on my uh, bank balance. In my accounting record, I add interest earned, take out any bank fees, any non-sufficient non funds fees, I add or subtract any book errors. Again, we want to make sure that our bank is in balance with our amount that we have on our balance sheet for cash. So this is the process we use. From a step perspective, we take the bank statement. We go through the process of adding in anything that's in transit, outstanding checks that haven't been cashed yet, to get the adjusted cash balance. And then on our accounting record, on our balance sheet, we add in any interest that we earned on our account, any notes that we had collected on, and we subtract out any bank charges, non-sufficient fund charges, to get our adjusted book balance. The adjusted book balance for both the bank statement and the balance sheet should match. That's what we call reconcile. And again, uh, for those of you who use QuickBooks or Sage or any of the other accounting softwares out there, that is also a step in the process. Uh, and, it's a, and it's built into the software to help you do bank reconciliations. So these are the adjusting entries that we make at the end of each month based off of our bank reconciliations. Collection of a note, debit cash, credit accounts receivable. If we earned interest on our bank account, debit cash, credit interest revenue. Yes, interest is revenue if when we're earning it on our amount of cash in the bank. If we check printed any checks that the bank gave us, debit miscellaneous expense or bank fees, credit cash. For non-sufficient funds, debit accounts receivable to increase the account receivable for non-sufficient fund fee for that customer, credit cash. Then of course, no day could be left unturned without at least one ratio. <laughs> this one's called the day sales uncollected. Shows us how much time is likely to pass before we receive cash from our customers based off of sales we made on accounts receivable. So we take accounts receivable divided by net sales multiplied by 365 days. We want this number to be low. Okay, the lower the better. That means that because again, it tells us how much time goes by without us collecting from our customer. The lower the better. And just kind of recap uh, a couple of things. Making sure that we have a paper trail is so important in accounting. So that's why. I told you, and I told you about the story a few times now. That's why I always take the purchase order, the invoice, the packing slip, a copy of the check, staple those things together. Okay, that's my paper trail. We call that documentation and verification. If you ever get audited. You can prove what happened with that paper trail. Invoices, you typically go through an approval process. The accounting department looks at the uh, record and purchase and approve the payment after it's been done. 
information across all documents are verified. We look at invoices uh, through check authorization. And there's usually a checklist that we go through for invoice approvals. Vouchers, again, this part's part of your discussion board, yeah, for Sunday. Vouchers are complete after invoice set, vouchers are complete after the invoice has been checked and approved. Used to authorize recording obligation. Certain information is required on the inside of a voucher. It contains information also required on the outside of a voucher. So Any comments, questions, or concerns about internal controls and cache controls? Everyone's good? Okay, great. Uh, I want to briefly talk about the midterm exam. So let me go ahead and uh, go back into the classroom and I'm going to show you the midterm exam. Um, let me switch into student view so I can show you what that looks like. Okay, so module two, week four. By this Sunday night, you owe me three things. I cannot and will not accept the midterm exam late. Let me repeat that. I cannot and will not accept the midterm exam late. It must, must be completed this Sunday night. No exceptions. You can do it early, but you can't do it late. Okay? Be very, very clear on that. You owe me three things. The chapter 7 quiz. Five questions, true, false, multiple choice, just like the other stuff, ones you see. Chapter 8, discussion board. It's on vouchers. Okay. All I need you to do is ask, answer these three questions. Answer in full paragraphs. Good job, Dua. Very nice. Full paragraphs, just like that. Wonderful. Good job, Christian. Exactly what I'm looking for. Good job, Rayan. That's what I'm looking for. Uh full paragraphs, and then respond to two of your classmates with full paragraphs. If it's a one-sentence response or a good job, that doesn't count. It has to be full paragraphs, please. That's the discussion board. Do this Sunday night. So one response, two responses to your classmates. So three total posts, yeah? One original, two responses. The midterm exam. Oh, the midterm. Good God, the midterm. I can't believe we're here already. Okay, the midterm exam. Move this stuff out of the way. Quick view assessment. Let's take a look at it. It is a mix of true, false, multiple choice. It is 10 questions. Each question is worth one and a half points. Ooh, high stakes, I know. The midterm exam is worth 10% of your entire grade. It's worth a full letter grade. Yeah, I know. Okay, let's look at the questions. Question one. Lucia Company reported cost of goods sold for years one and two as follows. Gang inventory, cost of goods sold, Purchases, cost of goods available for sale, and inventory, cost of goods sold. Company made two errors. Adding inventory at the end of year one was understated by 16600 And year two was overstated by 7600 Given this information, the correct cost of goods sold for year two would be 
just take a look at the cost of goods sold for year two. And uh, year two, 7,600. So that should be a pretty straightforward calculation for you. Uh, I'm trying to remember what chapter that's from. Uh, a chapter on adjusting enemies. Uh, six, I think. Question two. The unadjusted trial balance. Columns of a company's worksheet shows balance of $460 for supplies. Adjustment columns show credit of 260 the amount shown at the store supplies on the balance sheet uh, columns of the worksheet is that that question is going to come from uh what chapter is that it's probably it's gonna be five or six so that's when we talked about uh, the unadjusted trial balance. Question three. At the end of the first month of operations, JMP Consulting reported revenue of 37000 It also reported wages of 6000 rent expenses of 5000 utilities expense 1000 Calculate net income. Reported on the income statement, net income. Net income, as you remember, the formula for net income, revenue minus all the expenses. Revenue minus all the expenses. So 37,000 minus 6 minus 5 minus 1 equals, that's your amount. Question four, which of the following statements about electronic funds transfer is false? We just talked about electronic funds transfer in this last chapter for internal controls. You should find that there. Question five, another formula. Which of the following year end information to calculate acid test ratio, acid test ratio, acid test ratio. Okay, so all you need to do is know what the acid test ratio has in it, plug in those numbers in that formula. Question six, increases in equity from a company's sales of products or services to customers are The answer is in the question. Increases in equity from a company's sales of products or services to customers. Sales of products or services to customers generates revenue. Question seven, assume that a company uses general ledger as well as special journals for sales, purchases, cash receipts, and cash payments. And that sounds familiar, that was chapter seven. Sales return for a credit on account will be recorded in the check chapter seven, question seven. Question eight, unlimited liability and separate taxation of the business are advantages of a sole proprietorship. I think that's chapter one. Okay, chapter one. Question nine, a company reported net income of $6,480. 
the net sales were 18,000. What's the profit margin? Profit margin is a formula. You will be able to find the answer. Calculate the formula. I think it's like sales divided by net income or something like that, right? Or is it net income divided by sales? I don't remember. It's in there. It's in there, I promise you. Question 10. A debit entry will always increase an account. No, no, it won't. It only increases assets. Not the other way around. So that is definitely false. Any questions on the midterm exam? No. Okay, great. Uh, the midterm exam, they can only be taken one time, only once, only one attempt on the midterm exam, midterm and final, only one try. I will also say it's, it's not timed, so don't worry about a timer. You can open it and come back to it. If you, you know, uh, it's open book and open note. So if you select a response and you're like, ah, I think it's right, but not that sure, click save and close. Save and close and then come back to it. Just open it up again. Uh, take your time with it. It's not timed. You can open it and close it. Save your responses. Come back to it later. It's open book, open note. There's no reason for you not to get 100% on this thing. So that's the midterm exam. So again, to recap, by Sunday night, you owe me Chapter 7 quiz, Chapter 8 discussion board, and the midterm exam. Cannot be late on the midterm exam. I cannot accept that past Sunday night. Everyone's good? You all know what to do? Yes. Wonderful. I recommend that you get started today. Okay? It's a lot of work, I know. Sorry. It's an eight-week course. Got to get through it. Okay, y'all. Well, I appreciate all of you so very much for your time today. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can email me, call me, set up office hours. Whatever you need, here for you all the time. I wish you all the best on the midterm exam. And with that, stay safe. Wash your hands. Do the right things, and I'll see you all again next Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Bye-bye.